Hello, it is Wednesday, the 16th of October, 2024. I haven't actually done one of these uh, Laserdisc uh, dives for, for a while. Um, yeah, I, I, what can I say? I got lazy. Um, so I think uh, I've, I've actually built up, um, I've amassed such a collection of, of laser discs. I think that the thought of, of leafing through and talking about all of them was, you know, became very daunting. But anyway, finally decided to um, look at a selection. These are some of the latest ones I've got. So I'm sort of jumping ahead a little bit. I can, I, I will have to double back and, and look at, um, you know, the boxes of, of um, ones that I have. Um, yeah. Um, apologies, my, my voice is a little bit a little bit rusty. If I can if I can get through this, you know, who knows? Who knows? Maybe my my enthusiasm will be reinvigorated, and I, I I'll do more of these for the, uh, the 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 dozens of you that that might be watching. This is a laser disc or a a laser vision video disc, apparently, of Sisters, the 1972 film by by Brian De Palma. Uh, this is a UK uh, laser disc. Um, it says Spectrum here. Um, I think that's a subsidiary of. Um, Polygram video because we can see uh, Polygram video there. So this was released in this laser disc was released in in 1983. So um, you know just over, the movie was just over a decade old at this point. Paid um, eight dollars for this, not too not too bad. Um, okay, so Sisters um, is a uh, sort of a suspense thriller murder mystery. Um, Margot Kidder um, plays um, dual roles in it. Um, a, a pair of uh, conjoined twins and it's a sort of uh, mystery involving her character or, or characters um as it were um the cast also includes uh, jennifer salt uh charles durning um is in this and um william finley um who became the lead in De Palma's um phantom of the paradise he he's in this as well he plays a, a pretty a pretty uh, creepy character a, a sort of a creepy doctor um so yeah um i really i really do like sisters it's kind of um I think it was De Palma's first like non-comedy film. He'd sort of made a few motion pictures before this, um, mostly independent stuff, and they were like fairly explicitly comedies. Sisters is in a more serious vein, although it does actually have some humour um, in it. Um, De Palma did um, continue to combine um, humour and and sort of you know shocks and thrills and stuff, m much in the same way that you know uh, Hitchcock did. And there's a lot of um, uh, there's a there's a lot of a um, Hitchcockian influence in this. Um, you know the the film the story draws upon um, Psycho and um, Rear Window a bit, and there's like and um, also stuff like there's a lot of like exp German expressionism uh, influences and stuff like uh, Cat People. The original Cat People is is an influence on this. Dr. Caligari. Um, it's a very visually visually um, interesting film. Um, you know, De Palma uses a lot of great tricks. Um, you know, the, with the editing and the tracking shots and, and the use of color. It's it's a it's a really good film. I mean, it's a bit, you know, it, it's kind of De Palma, the filmmaker in progress. Like it's it's um it's a bit rough compared to his his later stuff, but it's um you know it's still it's still pretty good. So we can see that there are some um, excerpts from reviews of the film that are sort of being used uh, on the blurb at the back, and one of them does uh, mention Psycho. Um, one of the there is a. Um, one of the obvious uh, psycho influences in this is the fact that um, there's a character that kind of, you know, it's sort of you think is kind of being built up as 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 a protagonist or a co-protagonist, um, getting uh, killed off quite unexpectedly, um, you know. So I guess um, spoiler alert, um, yeah. And oh, and it does have. Um, I would be remiss to mention um, there is a there's a great uh, music score by uh, the legendary Bernard Herrmann. Um, who scored, um, you know, most of Hitchcock's best-known films? Um, so that's a, that's another, uh, um, you know, creative link between um, Alfred Hitchcock and and Brian De Palma. I do have an old VHS copy of of Sisters, the same movie. So this is a Australian VHS release, um, released in 1983 by by Roadshow Home Video. Uh, I'm a big fan of these old um, Roadshow Home Videos. They had a kind of a uniform design, um, which um, VH nostalgic VHS enthusiasts, um, you know, like me, we, we, we're all big fans of, of, of these, of these films, but, um, yeah, sisters, um, well, well worth checking out. Um, you know, especially, especially if you're into the, the filmography of, of Brian De Palma. Uh, here we have a laser disc of Jesus Christ Superstar, the 1973, um, film version of the Andrew Lloyd Webber, Tim Rice, um, musical, um, the 1970 um, rock opera double album, etc. Um, yeah, I actually already have a copy of this. I got it um, in a consignment of 
um, laser discs that I I bought on eBay uh, a couple of years ago. So, but I saw this other copy and it was you know it was only five dollars. So you know what the what the heck. Um, so yeah, I'm a big I'm a big fan of this film as as I've said before. Um, it's probably my second favorite um, version of of Jesus Christ Superstar after the original the original album. Um, but yeah, the songs are the songs are good. Um, the performances are pretty good. Um, you know, Ted Neely, Carl Anderson, um, Von Elliman, uh, Barry Denon. Yeah, so I haven't really got anything anything to fault this with. Um, interestingly, um, this film was released. Um, it was directed by Norman Jewison. It was uh, released in 1973, uh, the same year that there was a film version of the other um, Jesus Christ um, musical, Godspell. Um, they're both very different films. Um, uh, Godspell is more sort of like wacky, wacky vaudevillian, hippie devotional stuff, and Jesus Christ Superstar is uh, Jesus Christ Superstar is sort of less folky, hippie, and it's sort of um, a bit more um, edgy or a bit more rock oriented. Um, and and story wise, they're they're both quite different as well. Um, Godspell is like a series of parables um, from the Gospel of Saint Matthew, and Jesus Christ Superstar is a sort of a kind of a cynical. Um, take on the last uh, the last week of Jesus Christ's life but uh, yeah um I- I'd like to get a laser disc copy of, of God's Bell sometime because I I am a fan of of, of that movie as as well I-, I paid the princely sum of eight Australian dollars for this uh laser disc of the rose the uh, 1979 um uh sort of musical uh drama film um, released by 20th Century Fox this is a 20th Century Fox video uh a laser disc um starring uh, Bette Midler um, in one of her, early, I don't know if it was her earliest um, it, film, or her, I think it was her earliest um, lead role in a film, at least um, with with Alan Bates and Frederick Forrest as well. Um, I saw this film for the first time um, relatively recently. Um, I do have it on, on DVD, and 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 it's pretty good. Um, you know, with uh, Bette Midler playing kind of a, a sort of a, a rock star, and with all the um, the, the excesses and um, you know turbulence and stuff that entails. Um, I'm not 100 percent sure, but I think um, this film began as it was supposed to be a biopic of Janis Joplin, um, and then for whatever reason, I think maybe there were rights issues or maybe there's something to do with the Janis Joplin's family. I don't know, but then um, it sort of they just sort of turned it into a fictionalized um, you know story. So it's not. Not explicitly a Janis Joplin film, although it's it's heavily influenced by her. I think that's what happened. But anyway, um, this is a pretty good, um, sort of a double gatefold, uh, sort of sort of deal. So we've got, uh, you know, uh, quite a lot of of text there. Um, there's Alan Bates and Frederick Forrest, of, and there's there's Bette Midler. So yeah, this is a pretty good, nice, uh, nice, nice looking release. Uh, another uh, <clears throat> sort of '60s uh, infused. Uh, rock music biopic. Uh, this is The Doors, the uh, 1991 Oliver Stone film uh, about the American rock band of the 1960s, 1970s, um, primarily focused, of course, on on um, Jim Morrison, the le- the lead singer. Uh, so this is uh, this is an Australian laser disc um, from TriStar Pictures and first release. I think first release is a subsidiary of Roadshow. A home video. I do have quite a lot of uh, VHS copies of movies from from first release, but anyway, so um, have a look at this. So yeah, there's uh, there's Val Kilmer as as Jim Morrison. Um, uh, the other doors are played. There's um, Kyle MacLachlan as Ray Manzarek, um, Frank Whaley as Robbie Krieger, and Kevin Dillon as as John Densmore. Um, the other big star in this is um, Meg Ryan, who plays um, Pamela Corson, um, Jim Morrison's. Uh, girlfriend. Okay, so um, the doors. This is a film that I have kind of a, a complicated history with. Um, so, in the um, when I was sort of my late teens, I, I went through a bit of a doors phase, as you know, a lot of a lot of people do. You know, listen to, you know, I, I got and listened to all their albums. Um, you know, had a, read all the biographies and and everything. So, um, this film, the Oliver Stone film, is a bit of a sore point because. Um, there was a bit of a, you know, I could sort of, there was so many things in it that Oliver Stone uh, made up and there's a lot of like fabrications and stuff. Um, and I think um, I think this film kind of did damage to, to The Doors' um, reputation. Like I think I kind of feel that after this movie came out, um, the, the Doors became sort of a, a lot more mockable. Like they kind of became like sort of very, <laughs> a very uncool band, I think. And I think the pendulum's come back the other way. I think now they're kind of, 
you know, maybe they're kind of regarded as maybe being a bit um, underrated because of, you know, I think this this film was kind of the apex. I mean, beginning with um, the early 80s, there was a, the, a famous Rolling Stone um, cover and, and retrospective of Jim Morrison. There was a the release of the, the biography, No One Here Gets Out Alive, like, and then there was the use of the Doors music in Apocalypse Now. So sort of late 70s, early 80s, there was like a sort of a big revival of interest in, in the Doors who'd been kind of defunct as a band, um, you know, since, I guess, the early 1970s. Um, you know, so th- and then I feel this film was kind of um, the apex of like the Doors popularity, and then it kind of you know the wind went out of the balloon a little bit with this, I think. Um, but yeah, I think um, because I think this film's kind of it's responsible for like the reputation of the Doors as being kind of um, I-, I guess a bunch of you know pretentious um, hippies, you know, with a you know a, a, dr- a drunken alcoholic dickhead lead singer which is kind of true but it's also a little bit reductive i mean i think jim morrison um you know i don't think he was you know the sort of the dionysian genius that you know hippie um ideologues paint him as i think he's but he was you know a very charismatic and talented um rock singer with a good voice and he was a good songwriter and i I mean maybe i mean this film does kind of posit this notion that he was a frustrated poet sort of living it as a rock star but I think a lot of his poetry doesn't really look so good on paper, but they they do work. Um, his 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 writing does work as impressionistic song lyrics, and I think Jim Morrison, I think um, as opposed to the kind of you know kind of humorless guy he is in this movie, um, I think the real Jim Morrison, um, I think he had a sense of humor about himself. I think he was a bit of a deadpan prankster. I don't think he took himself entirely seriously, um, and I think this film kind of loses that. So I sort of think that a lot of the um, the stuff that Oliver Stone makes up and his sort of filmic excesses, which you sort of expect in an Oliver Stone film, that doesn't really bother me as such these days. Um, I think it's more to do with the fact that he kind of... Um, I, I don't know if this is really... Um, you know, I don't think the band really comes off very well um, in this in this movie, which is a bit which is a bit unfortunate. But, I mean, it's quite visually spectacular. There are, there are some good performances. Um, Val, Val Kilmer is really good. I mean, any problems I have with the portrayal of Jim Morrison in this movie... Are to do with the the way it was written. It's nothing. It's nothing to do with um, Val Kilmer, who's pretty, who who is pretty good in this. Um, yeah, obviously Oliver Stone had a, um, you know, a string of movies that are all kind of um, based on you know America of the nineteen sixties. Um, you know, there was obviously uh, there was Platoon, Born on the Fourth of July. Um, then there was The Doors, JFK, um, Nixon. You know, there's a there's a lot of you know a, a lot of that. I am a little intrigued by this bold, this is a brilliant movie, Siskel and Ebert. Um, I haven't actually seen Siskel and Ebert's review of The Doors, but I'm pretty sure um, Roger Ebert gave a not very good review of the film. I don't think he, I don't think, I don't think Ebert was a big fan of this movie, but, you know, maybe, maybe I'm wrong. So uh, this is an American Laserdisc uh, Bowie, the video collection. Um, so yeah, um, I'm a, I'm a huge, huge fan of, of the music of David Bowie. David Bowie was very, very important for me. Um, this is a collection from, I think it was from, uh, 1992 or 93. Um, so there was, uh, the B- Bowie, the video collection, there was, there was a, um, a compilation album, Bowie, the singles collection, um, uh, which was released on um you know cd lp cassette etc and this was the the equivalent of it there was this is released on vhs and laserdisc so um this is a collection of most of uh, uh david bowie's music videos up to and including 1990 um so yeah there's i think there's um 25 music videos um there are there are a lot of omissions in this because i think there might have been rights issues but i do remember that um uh, Bowie made some appearances on Soul Train in 1976, and they they sort of created music videos from that. Um, I think Fame and Golden Years, and they're not on they're not on here. Um, so yeah, it's kind of I, I guess because in the in the sort of early to mid 1970s music, it wasn't a given that singles would would have music videos made of them. So there's a lot of um, songs that Bowie released as singles that didn't have an equivalent music video. Uh, so it's not they're not here, but um, but overall this is pretty good. I mean. Uh, Bowie was one of those guys at the time, sort of in late seventies, early eighties, who recognised, um, you know, the music video as as an important um, ve- vehicle for artistic expression, and not just you know the way, uh, not just a means to, you know, sell the the, the latest single. So all of these music videos are, are really, really, really good. I'm trying to think of which ones in particular I, I like. Um, Life on Mars was quite good. That was when um, you know he's, he's in the, against that white backdrop. Um, heroes. Uh, Boys keep swinging. Um, that was uh, that was pretty 
that, that, that was pretty good. Um, di- um, was it uh, boys? That's when he had the catwalk stuff and everything, which was which was really good. Ashes to ashes, of course. Um, yeah, we can sort of see wild as the wind. So that's a that's from uh, the station to station album in 1976, but it's sort of been wedged here. Um, in between Fashion, which was 1980, and Let's Dance, which was 1983, I think there was. Uh, I think what happened was when the Changes One Bowie compilation was released in 1981. I think While Is the Wind was released as a single from that. So even though by that point the song was already um, five years old, they created the video afterwards to, to coincide with it being released as a single. So that's that. That's why uh, that is there. Uh, Let's Dance and China Girl. Uh, the videos for those were filmed in Australia, if if I remember correctly. Um, yeah, and um, actually, uh, Blue Jean and Loving the Alien, like they're from the Tonight album of 1984, which is not actually not a very well liked uh, David Bowie album. I actually kind of like it, and the music videos for that were pretty good. Um, then we've got uh, <laughs> the Dancing in the Street, the uh, the infamous video that Bowie did with with Mick Jagger. It gets a lot of grief. It is pretty cringe, uh, cringy stuff. But I think what a lot of people f- um, forget is that it was basically a video that was real, that was filmed very quickly and very quick, very um, cheaply, um, you know, because it was a charity single that was basically being rushed to release. So they didn't really have, I don't think they had too much time to do anything with it. And it's kind of, it's kind of hacky, but you know, it's not, um, I think, you know, I, I don't know how they could have made it any better. And then we've got some um, really cool um, uh, music videos from some of Bowie's um, film soundtrack stuff, uh, Absolute Beginners, uh, from the film of the same name, um, Underground, and As the World Falls Down, both from Labyrinth. Then we got some stuff from Never Let Me Down and Fame 90. So Fame uh, was, the original version of Fame was from 1975, the Young Americans album, but he, uh, Bowie did the Fame 90 remix, uh, and then there was, a, there was a video of that. So, yeah, this is a pretty good, it's a pretty good, pretty good collection. Um, I'm sure, um, if not on Laserdisc, I'm sure there have been much more uh, comprehensive um releases of, of David Bowie's music videos. I remember in 2002, I think there was the best of Bowie. There was a DVD and that had more videos than this, although it, it still had some omissions, but yeah. Okay. So LA confidential, um, the 1997 movie, this is a 1998, um, American laser disc from, from Warner home video. Okay. So, um, yeah, this is a pretty, this is a pretty great movie. Um, LA confidential, the sort of uh, murder mystery uh, set in Los Angeles of the 19, 1950s, uh, directed by Curtis Hansen, um, who also uh, co-wrote the screenplay based on the the, the novel by James Elroy. Um, yeah, so I'm I'm a big fan of this movie. I didn't uh, I didn't see it uh, um, theatrically. I didn't see it when it when it played in the cinemas, but I watched it on um, I think on video some years later, and I, I have actually seen it uh, since. I saw I, I did go to a, a screening of it. Um, I think maybe about ten, about ten years ago. Um, so yeah, this is a good, um, great cast. Um, you know, Kevin Spacey. You know, back when Kevin Spacey starring as something wasn't wasn't problematic. Um, Russell Crowe and Guy Pearce. Um, so this is, I think, this is probably the first major American film uh, that uh, Russell Crowe and Guy Pearce had done. So probably, um, I think it would have been the first time that um, audiences outside of Australia had seen had seen these guys, and they've obviously both gone on to enjoy very. Uh, very good careers. Um, uh, who else is in this? Oh, James Cromwell, um, David Strathin, um, uh, Kim Basinger, um, Danny DeVito. Did uh, did Kim Basinger win the win the Academy Award for this, um, or was that for Eight Mile? Was it for Eight Mile? I can't remember. Um, anyway, yeah. So so uh, great great movie. It um so it was released in 1997. I remember it was up against um it didn't win Best Picture. Um, <laughs> that was the year of um. Titanic. It was up against Titanic, which which obviously won. But um, I think this is I, I think this is a far far better movie. I mean, this is I, I think this could this could lay claim to being one of the greatest uh, greatest movies ever made. To be to be perfectly to be perfectly honest, it's just one of those movies. It's a little bit like um uh, like Chinatown. You watch it and it just grabs you, and you just get really involved in this sort of you know labyrinth um like mystery that's uh, that, that's going on um. You know, it's 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 really good, and like Chinatown, it has a, a Jerry Goldsmith uh, music score. So um, yeah, great, very very happy to have this one have this one on 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 Laserdisc. Uh, Doctor Zhivago, uh, the nineteen sixty five film. This is a nineteen ninety seven uh, Laserdisc from MGM UA, uh, an American American Laserdisc. Okay, so uh, the film uh, directed by the great David Lean. Um, this sort of 
uh, romantic uh, drama sort of swept up against the, the the sort of the backdrop of the of the Russian Revolution. Uh, yeah, so it was directed by by David Lean. I think this is his first movie after Lawrence of Arabia. I'm pretty sure uh, Lawrence of Arabia was sixty two. Uh, Zhivago was 65. Um, so it's a good, I mean, it's a pretty long movie. It's like three and a half hours long. Um, you know, great um, all-star cast. Um, Julie Christie, I think, made the biggest uh, impression in this. You've got um, uh, Geraldine Chaplin, um, Tom Courtney, Alec Guinness, Siobhan McKenna, Ralph Richardson. I love the fact that um, Omar Sharif is kind of like buried in the middle there, in brackets, as Zhivago, you know, the kind of the main <laughs> the main character. Um, you know, um, uh, Rod Steiger was in this as well. Um, yeah, so this is a good. It, it's interesting. Um, I kind of, I'm not really as all in on Zhivago as I am on some of David Lean's other epic films. Like I like um, uh, Lawrence of Arabia, and I like um, Bridge in the River Kwai better. Um, Zhivago's pretty good, um, but I think this is a point where I think you know Lean started you know doing these kind of. Um, melodramas which um you know which is okay with this one i think when he made ryan's daughter after this one that was the one where it felt like the 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 story didn't really justify the length but at least with this one you know you've got sweeping um you know political stuff and you've got battles and you've got you know um you know it's all quite it feels like it kind of justifies the length it's a sort of movie that you know i don't know if they really make them like this anymore but anyway so this is a pretty great um you know, we can see it's a it's a, a two four sides across across um you know two discs. So yeah, this is pretty pretty good. I haven't actually seen this for a while. I've only seen it once, and that was a very long time ago. So maybe it's due. Maybe I, I, I'm due to due to rewatch it. It's got the that um that Maurice Jarre score um with that Lara's theme, which um I think um I think it was Roger Ebert wrote a sort of a retrospective review of this film, and he kind of he kind of did a bit of a some catty comments about the the Lara's theme. I think maybe, um, it, I think it was very popular at the time, and I think maybe um, it, he just didn't like it and he got sick of it, um, Roger E, but I don't know. But uh, yeah. Uh, here we have um, the original Star Wars from 1977. Uh, this is a 1982 Laserdisc release uh, from 20th Century Fox Video. This is a, um, a UK uh, release. So, um, it's got. We can see it's got the the famous uh, Tom Young um, poster artwork um, used here. Um, something I really like uh, about these early 20th Century Fox uh, laser discs is I, I really do like that sort of uniform design. I've got a few others which which sort of have this. Um, so it's pretty it's pretty good. Um, and yeah, uh, something I'm not really a big fan of is the. Um, there's a sort of a, a miss a misspelling here. You know, venturesome Luke Skywalker and dashing spaceship captain. Hans Solo, not Hans Solo, Hans Solo. Oh, well, well. Hans. I, I do have the equivalent VHS edition of that 1982 laser disc. So this is a 1982 UK VHS um, of Star Wars from 20th Century Fox. I, I actually... Um, I got this quite by chance. Um, I was at a swap meet and someone was selling it for... Uh, not very, not very much at all. So we can sort of see, um, you know, very, very similar to the to the laser disc. Um, in fact, I'm pretty sure it's even got. Uh, uh, yep, there we go. Our old friend Hans Solo. Hans! And needless to say that uh, hailing from 1982. Um, this release predates the the special edition um, of Star Wars, so this is a you know my preferred um, version of the film, which is the the original theatrical cut. Although I think technically, um, I don't think the original theatrical cut of of Star Wars has ever been released um, officially on video because um, when it was released in 1977, there were actually several different sound mixes. There was a uh, I think there was a 70 millimeter um, Dolby surround. Mix there was a set, there was a thirty five millimeter stereo and there was a thirty five millimeter mono and they all have differences between them and then I think when they released the movie uh, on home video in the early nineteen eighties they kind of it was kind of like a composite sound mix which I mean I guess outside of hardcore Star Wars fans no one's really going to no one's really going to know but the um I think that the original home video release of of, of Star Wars um had bits and bobs from the various three um. Uh, theatrical mixes but anyway um it's not really a huge a huge 
thing. I, most people didn't notice that, the, that any differentiation with the film until uh, George Lucas released the special editions in 1977. But that's a whole other uh, uh, a whole other story. Uh, one of these days, I'm going to have to actually get a, a laser disc and uh, see if these. Um, how many of these discs um, actually actually play. Righty-ho, uh, here we have Cruising, the 1980 film. Uh, this is a 1982 uh, Laserdisc from, from CBS Video. This is an American, an American Laserdisc. Um, yeah, so, so Cruising, um, this, is a, this is an interesting film, uh, enormously uh, controversial um, film, film at the time. Um, it uh, stars Al Pacino as a as a police a young police officer who um, goes undercover. There's a series of um, murders, like stabbing killings, um, in the uh, the gay uh, community of I think it was Matt, uh, Manhattan's uh, West Village. So Pacino sort of goes undercover and he kind of has to sort of um, immerse himself in the the the, the leather bar um, sort of um, scene um, of of the you know of of that time. Uh, the film. Um, it's it was directed by by William Friedkin, um, so obviously the, the director of of the the Exorcist, the French Connection, uh, Sorcerer. So this was kind of um, you know a, a sort of a gritty police thriller. Um, you know, it sort of recalls the, the French Connection in some respects, and Al Pacino um, as a cop, a kind of um, you know is reminiscent in, in 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 some some ways as as Serpico, the 1973 um, Sidney Lumet film. Although this is obviously very very different. I mean, it kind of um, you know, it, it sort of predates the whole kind of like serial killer, um, you know, subgenre that would become much more, um, you know, much more prevalent in, in, in later years. Um, but yeah, so the film, it was kind of, um, you know, it was the source of a lot of, um, there was a lot of controversy, a lot of speculation. Um, um, there was there was like the film was picketed, um, filming w was disrupted. Um, there was a very hostile reaction to the filming of this movie. Um, I think because it was perceived that it was uh, the film was kind of a slur on the on the on the gay community. It was like you know supposedly depicting um, you know the 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 homosexual sub you know um, you know a particular facet of the homosexual subculture being like you know decadent and um, and stuff. It's kind of I think I don't know. I don't think the film is. I don't think the film is homophobic. I mean, I think it's just um, it's depicting a series of murders that happen um, in a particular place. Um, you know, in particular, um, you know, locations and stuff. Um, I don't think the film is positing that you know that gay people of this time were inviting death uh, upon them. Um, I think the film is actually a lot more. Um, it, it's sort of it, it's it's. It's not quite as as loathed uh, today. It's actually there are some you know it, it it's actually been been reevaluated, um, in 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 a lot of ways. Um, some of the stuff is actually kind of funny. Um, it might have been funny then as well, and it's especially funny now. I mean, like Al Pacino, he's really good uh, in this, uh, but I kind of feel that um maybe he was a bit too old for this role. Like, I I think the the character he plays is supposed to be kind of like a young patrolman, sort of like a, a rookie cop, and Pacino was like. He must have been like 39, 40 when they made this. So I, I don't know. It feels like maybe, um, you know, maybe he wasn't, uh, maybe he, he does feel slightly miscast. And then you've got him getting up in his, you know, his Gestapo cap and his leather jacket and his permed hair and his makeup and everything. Um, you know, he does some, I'm sure it's been memed uh, that Pacino is dancing in this because there's a lot of like dance uh, dance scenes uh, in this movie in the, the, the leather bars. Um, and there's some other things in it. Um, I think there was a scene, like a police interrogation scene, that's actually really. I'm not going to spoil it, but it's just it, it. It's just it's just like it just has a really what the hell kind of uh, kind of moment. So Paul Sorvino and, and Karen Allen are, are in this. We can sort of there's actually a misprint um, here, not quite as um, uh, not not quite as as bad as the the Hans Solo thing, but you can sort of see it. So it says produced by uh, Jerry Weintraub, you know, all in capital letters, then written. Capital letters and then small letters for the screen and directed by William Friedkin. Capital letters a bit inconsistent. I don't know why. Um, I think maybe produced by and written shouldn't be uppercase there, but um, yeah, whatever. Um, yeah, it's still it's still a pretty it's a pretty interesting movie. Um, there's a few um, factoids uh, I can remember about this film. Uh, there's a character that gets killed, um, and when his corpse is discovered, it's actually um, the guy that played the role 
um, he said that it was based, it was influenced by by a David Bowie album, and that would be the um, album Lodger from 1979, which has um, Bowie um, sort of splayed um, across, kind of like beaten up, and that's kind of the pose. That was kind of what they were going for with with that scene. Uh, the other thing I remember about this um, is that um, I'm a big fan of uh, the Clash, the um, uh, the UK rock group, The Clash, um, and they were actually asked by uh, Jack Nietzsche, the um, the guy that did the music for this. They were kind of asked to do a, to provide a song for this movie, um, and they came up with the song "Somebody Got Murdered," which for whatever reason was never used. I think The Clash said that Jack Nietzsche or whoever the studio they never actually got back to them, uh, so they had the song and it ended up on their um, uh, 1980 uh, triple album "Sandinista," which is my favorite Clash album. So "Somebody Got Murdered" it's a pretty it's a pretty good song was written for this movie, never got used, uh, ended up um, elsewhere. So, yeah. So, um, yeah, I think a film, um, you know, it, it, it's kind of intense. It's pretty it's pretty violent. It's obviously quite, uh, quite sexual. And it kind of, um, there was a whole sort of thing, I think in the 70s, um, I think this whole um, idea of the, the sort of the seamy underbelly of like the sort of late night um, bars and pickups and everything. There was um, Looking for Good Bar in 1977, with the movie with Diane Keaton, it's kind of a little similar to this. It's kind of, you know, might have made some people a bit paranoid about, you know, that that particular, you know, cruising for, you know, um, one night stands in bars or whatever. I don't know, but it's kind of, um, it's it's still, I I still think this movie holds up um, pretty well. I'm actually uh, curious as to the studio. So it's distributed by 20th Century Fox London. Um, oh, so sorry, my mistake. This is actually a Great Britain. This is a UK uh, laser disc. It's not an American, not an American laser disc. I should have, you know, looked at this a bit closely before I started, before I started jabbering. But um, yeah, I haven't actually watched um, Cruising for a while. I do have. I've got a DVD, and I do have a. There was a Blu-ray, um, a release, a pretty good Blu-ray uh, release. I think it might have been from Arrow Academy. Um, but um, yeah, it's 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 really good. There's a lot of extra features, extra features on it. Um, so if William Friedkin, he did this um, after Sorcerer in 1977, which is a brilliant movie, but didn't actually do especially well at the box office. It got kind of um, destroyed by by Star Wars. Um, he Friedkin, he did the uh, the Brinks job in 1978 or 79. I think it was 79, which is kind of like a caper heist comedy. And then he did Cruising in 1980. So this is kind of a return to, um, as I said before, kind of like the, the, the French Connection kind of... Um, uh, ground uh, of, of freaking. Um, interestingly, um, when um, William Peter Blatty uh, wanted to do a follow-up to The Exorcist, um, Friedkin, of course, directed the film version of The Exorcist in 1973. When William Peter Blatty um, had the idea of doing a follow-up, it was a, it was supposed to be a movie that he wanted William Friedkin to, to direct. Uh, Friedkin actually didn't do it because, um, according to Blatty at least, because of cruising, because um, Friedkin had just done a movie uh, involving a serial killer, involving, you know, knives and stuff. And that was, you know, Blatty's proposed follow-up. Legion had a serial killer, it had stabbings and stuff in it, and Friedkin just didn't want to do another movie. He was probably conscious that of the, you know, the 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 grief that he got for making this movie, he didn't really want to do something, you know, so, you know, so similar again. Um, so he didn't do it. He did, um, oh, what was it, Deal of the Century, which is a really bad comedy with Chevy Chase, Gregory Hines, and Sigourney Weaver. Um, William Peter Blatty um, wrote Legion as a novel and then Blatty himself later directed the film version uh, in 1990 which is uh, The Exorcist 3 um, yeah so there you go cruising uh, so there you go I will try to um, do some more of these some more of these videos um, I'll try and dig up some dig up some more stuff but uh, yeah until then uh, keep safe and uh, you know don't take any crap from anyone, huh?